Welcome to episode 88 of Anchored in Education. I'm E. Scott England, and Anchored in Education is the podcast dedicated to all things education. Educators across the world routinely engage in conversations surrounding fundamentals, concepts, and new ideas that improve this great profession. Sometimes we agree, other times we disagree. But at the end of the day, we are all anchored in education. When I moved to Maryland back in August, I struggled to find a place to live. I looked at plenty of rental options, but nothing quite fit my needs or budget. The same went with homes that were for sale. Needless to say, I was definitely a buyer in a seller's market. So I decided to do something I had always wanted to do, but had never had the chance or courage. I bought a condo that was in need of being totally renovated. I'm talking, stripped the flooring down to the subfloor, all the kitchen cabinets taken out, no more appliances, all electric outlets, switches, and light fixtures, gone. I was able to leave the drywall, but every square inch of it needed primed and painted. Same went with the ceiling. The demolition part was easy. A lot of sweat and trips to the dump later, I had gutted the condo. Then came the part I had never done, putting it all back together. I would like to say everything went smooth, but I won't because I can't lie to my listeners. I struggled. An example that comes quickly to mind is when I installed the new base cabinets. I was so proud of myself as I shimmed the bottom and the back to level each cabinet perfectly in all directions. I clamped the frames together as I drilled a pilot hole with a countersink so I could secure the cabinets to one another. Proud as a peacock, I put the drawers back in and the doors back on. Then I discovered the drawer of my blind corner cabinet wouldn't go in because it was too close to the sink base cabinet. And and the doors of each of those, well, they wouldn't even fully open. If I was being assessed, I would have done poorly. As it turns out, with blind corner cabinets, you have to offset them from the adjacent wall by at least six inches. I was close, but not there yet. Which is why when I found today's guest and topic, it plucked at my heartstrings because I, an adult educator with advanced degrees, had myself just experienced productive struggle. And it felt good. That is exactly what my guest Peg Grafwalner will tell you. Productive struggle is an amazing approach to learning. She even published a book with Solution Tree called Not Yet. And that's okay. How Productive Struggle Fosters Student Learning. Peg is an instructional coach on the south side of Milwaukee with more than 25 years of experience. She knows a thing or two about how a not-yet mindset can lead to amazing results. And she's going to share more with us today. Peg, welcome to Anchored in Education. Well, thank you, Scott. I'm thrilled to be here. I am thrilled that you are here uh, to have this conversation because since we first connected, all I have really thought about is productive struggle. It was uh, it was an intriguing article that I first read, and then we had our conversation to sort of get ready for today's interview. And, and I've thought about it a lot and a lot of the pieces that we're going to discuss, and I'm excited to get into it. But before we do, we'd like to find out a little bit more about you and how you became Anchored in Education. Well, thank you. Once again, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I think like most of us, You know, I had that inspiring English teacher. Now, as I said, in my case, it was English, but it was an inspiring teacher that encouraged me to continue studying. Um, There wasn't a lot of money at my house for college. There wasn't, uh, it wasn't big on my parents' radar. So as much as I wanted to go to school, it just wasn't in the cards. So I went into the world of work. But when I did have the opportunity um, to go back to school, I did. And I majored in English. And like I said, it was an inspiring teacher who encouraged me to go. Um, so I've been in education about 30 years now. Uh, most recently, for the last eight, I've been an instructional coach and reading specialist at Ronald Reagan 
College Preparatory High School okay. in Milwaukee. And um, my day, you know, it's, it's, I call myself an instructional coach. And the reason I use that title is because the school's title is very vague. <laughs> so when you say instructional coach, most people at least have an idea of what that means. But I'll give you an, an example of what my day looks like. And, okay. and I'd like to tell um, your listeners, full disclosure, yeah. um, I no longer am a teacher of record. I no longer have a roster of students. So as a coach, I collaborate with teachers. Okay. And my goal is to help them embed literacy without disrupting their classroom objectives. Ah. And what I mean by that, Scott, is the last thing you want is me at your door giving you one more thing. Right. Um, as I often tell, as I often tell people, my goal is not to should on you. I my goal is what I can take off your plate. So, uh, as an example, most recently I worked with the Fayette teacher, and he was teaching a class on ultimate frisbee. Well, I bet you didn't know this, but ultimate frisbee, the the makers of it, were trying to make ultimate frisbee an Olympic sport. Oh. Uh, they were kind of pushing for that. Exactly. By the way, it didn't pass uh, the Olympic committee. But oh. <laughs> I found this article about the background of ultimate frisbee, the rules, history of the game, all of that. I took that to the FIAD coach and I said, what do you think if I create a main idea, detail, and summary lesson? I'll use about a half of your class time. Uh, we're on a block schedule. Okay. And I'll come in and, and teach this. And he thought that was great. So that's what I mean about not disrupting the classroom objective. He was already teaching ultimate frisbee. I was able to add a little bit of background to it, a little bit uh, of history to it for the student's sake. So we jigsawed the article. They found that main idea. They wrote some detail, wrote a summary. And my goal of that was to show them that writing is not just done in English. It's not just done in the humanities. It's done in all our classes. Everywhere. And in order to write, and in order to communicate, we have to be strong writers. Um, I might be in a science class collaborating with a teacher, co-teaching a lesson on cause effect. I might be in the music class working with the teacher on compare and contrast um, composers. So my goal, like I said, is not to stay in English. That's too easy. I need to be out and I work with all teachers in all content areas to uh, continue, continually embed literacy uh, for the sake of our students. I, I love that. And when you talk about uh, every content area and embedding that literacy, um, you know, I know it's a step away from what we're talking about, but you have a new book coming out in May of 23, Clearing the Path for Developing Learners, Foundational Literacy Skills to Support Achievement in Every Content Area. So, I mean, not only are you you're telling us, I mean, you, you live and breathe this. This is kind of uh, your passion here. It really is, because like I said, I think it's, it's easy to compartmentalize, Scott, what we do. I mean, think about it. A lot of times, Teachers go in the classroom, close the door, and do their thing. Well, we, we don't live in that world. We live in a collaborative world. We live in a collaborative global society. So we need to show our students that all these wonderful skills we're learning are transferable, that I just don't write well in English. I need to write well yeah. in my in, as I write a student reflection in art. So that's really my goal is to um, do whatever I can, like I said, to help students understand the bigger picture. Yes, absolutely. And uh, you know, not only are you doing that, but you're also talking a lot about productive struggle, which is why I've got you on today. And many times students don't get something right off or whatever it is they're working on is, let's say, difficult. Uh, rather than students getting upset and quitting, we instead need to get them to understand that struggles are not only acceptable, but my goodness, struggles are a part of life. So before we go on, can you speak more on productive struggle and why it is a crucial part of the learning process? You know, when I think absolutely yes, and, and here's the thing with productive struggle, we need to let students know the work is going to be hard. Yeah. And oftentimes, oftentimes when students are working on a math problem or they're working on that science experiment and things don't go according to plan, think how easy it is to give up 
And what do students do? Oftentimes raise the hand and, you know, head out to the bathroom. We don't see them for 15 minutes. <laughs> or they get frustrated. They put their head down and they're done. We, we need to let them know. We need to build in, build in resources to tell them, okay, the work is going to be hard, but it's worthy of your time and talent. Yes, you will encounter setbacks. You will encounter obstacles. I guarantee it. But what resources are available to help you overcome those? And I'm not saying, when I'm, when I'm talking resources, Scott, I'm saying your teacher is a resource. Oh, absolutely. Your peer, right, your peers are a resource. What strategies have you used that maybe haven't worked? And where can we find some new strategies to try? And I think sometimes what happens is we are, we're always so focused on the end. Now, think about it. I understand the end has to be graded. I get that. The end is that artifact. The end is that product. But we need to show our students, demonstrate to them that this is a process. Okay, the first part, maybe it's not working for whatever reason. Again, what strategies have you used? And where can we find some new ideas, some new strategies to keep going? And, you know, when I talk about process, I really also want to focus on student reflection. Okay. When I taught my English class for, you know, I taught freshman English and, and other English classes for a good 20 years of my career, um, maybe longer. <laughs> but it's one of those things where I, I would often re- have students reflect at the end of a unit. Right. Looking back on that, big mistake on my part. We should have had that reflection on the process all the way through. Oh. What's working? What's not? Why not? What setback did you encounter? And how did you handle that setback? Not only academically, how did you handle it emotionally? How did you handle it mentally? You know, those are questions that, I, are we asking those questions enough of our students that I don't think we are? No, so I when don't I think, think we are of, either. When I talk, so when I think of and talk about productive struggle, Scott, we cannot eliminate the the frustrations, right? They're going to be there. We can't eliminate the setbacks. We can't eliminate the obstacles. They're there. Now, how do we focus, though, on the resources, those strategies to get us over that? And what are we learning along the way? And those are really, I think, the conversations um, that we we need to be having in class as well. You know, um, think think of a science experiment. We're looking for a certain answer or a certain response that's expected or required at the end of of that experiment. But what happens if the student didn't achieve, and I'm using air quotes here, the right answer? So what happens? Well, what what did we learn in the process? And that, I think, kind of sometimes gets kind of put on the back burner so we can achieve that product, achieve that artifact. Well, I think we need to pause back up a little bit and talk about process. So when I think of productive struggle, like I said, I'm really looking at understanding and embracing, helping our students to understand and embrace that there will be obstacles, there will be setbacks, what resources are available to help you overcome those. Yeah. And when you give your uh, science example of not getting the right answer, it Mm -hmm. actually is, it's a great segue, I believe. And, and to kind of the the next approach and and this approach and I love the idea it, it's called the not yet approach in fact uh, I think it's a great time to point out that uh, you had a book that came out with solution tree called not yet and that's okay how productive struggle <laughs> fosters student learning and so this is again something that is a common part of learning in general, regardless of age. It's also a great way to create an authentic classroom culture. So let's begin by discussing how creating a vigorous learning intention helps establish a not yet environment. Well, first of all, the vigorous learning intention and scaffolded success criteria are really the foundation of that not yet approach. And you'll notice You'll notice I use the word vigorous, and it's, it, it's very, it is meant to be a vigorous learning intention. Oftentimes, we'll use the word rigorous, and I often tell people, I'm telling your listeners that rigorous comes from the Latin word rigor, which means rigor mortis, yeah. and that means stiff and of death. 
Oh. The last thing we want is for that learning intention to be stiff or up death. Yeah. We want that learning intention to be exciting, interesting, empowering, engaging, all those great things. So that learning intention, first of all, has got to be written in such a way, you know, we want it in student-friendly language. And we also want it written as when the students come into class. Uh, let's face it, sometimes we're all rushed in the morning. I get that. And the teacher's rapidly writing the learning intention, you know, on the, on the smart board or, or typing on the smart board, writing on the chalkboard or butcher paper, whatever it is. Here's yeah. my point. It almost looks like it's an afterthought. It needs to be written that morning, the night before. So when students walk in, that's the first thing they see. It is in the same place every day. So it looks, and let's face it, it's an important document. It's important language. We want students to realize that. So first, so that's the first thing, learning attention. With the scaffolded success criteria, the reason it's scaffolded is so students can self-assess. And this is really important. Students will often be assessed by the teacher. Mm-hmm. And again, I get that. But when the, ga- when the success criteria is scaffolded, students then can self-assess. They can look at that and say, oh, did I meet criteria number one? I really didn't. I better go back. Or I did meet criteria number one. I can go on to two. And if I didn't meet one, if I'm already stuck there, then what are my resources? I can go to the teacher and get more clarification, or I can go to my peers. With the learning intention and the success criteria, give students the chat to ask questions about it and analyze it. Give them a chance to put that learning intention and the success criteria in their own words, to paraphrase it. After all, they're eventually going to show you what they know and what they're doing. Well, they can't do that unless it's clear to them the work in front of them. Sure. So that's why it's very important for not yet to have all of that, that foundational work done ahead of time. So it's very clear what students are, are meant to do. And again, with not yet, the whole idea is developing. We're, we'll, we're getting there together and we're getting there eventually. You know, as, as you were saying, Scott, um, none of us learn to ride that bike on <laughs> immediately, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, no. look how often we fell, how often we fell down, but we got back up again. And that's what I'm saying about not yet. We'll get there, but I'm just not there yet. But as long as I know what I'm supposed to do, and I have resources in place, and I can self-assess, then I'm going to be in good shape. And so as I'm listening to you talk, I mean, it's it's very similar to, you know, essentially having a, a rubric on, on your learning of being able to, to self-assess where you're at. Am I, am I hearing that correctly? It really is, because otherwise all that assessment has always come from the teacher. We need that assessment. We need that self-assessment to be a really, to be, to be a big part of this as well. We need students to be able to realize where they are and what they need to do to keep going. Yes. And what they need to do to be successful. You know, let's face it, some of the onus has to be put on the student. Sure, absolutely. And that, and that I think is very important. Yeah, and and I think that what I want to make sure that listeners are are hearing cuz I know that you talked a lot about uh you know, you're in a high school now and you taught high school. I was in elementary <laughs> uh and and that was my background. But you can do the same thing with with elementary kids and and even even as young as you know third grade first grade give them the opportunities to to look at where they are and and if they're not quite there yet they can see where they are and and still where they need to go and with that third grade student when they're when they're in the classroom sitting together give them a chance to ask questions of that learning intention because a third grader will have them Give them a chance to paraphrase the learning intention, paraphrase the success criteria to make sure they understand it. Because here's the thing, Scott, if they can't paraphrase it, you are seeing gaps already in the understanding of it. So what does that mean? Does that mean the teacher has to rewrite to make it even more clear? Possibly. But if students are asking a whole lot of questions about that scaffolded success criteria, or they're asking a whole lot of questions about that vigorous learning intention, 
then the teacher needs to say, okay, we all need to pause here because either I'm not clear on what I'm asking you to do, the language I'm using is not clear. Um, it really is, like I said, it really does show the gap in the understanding. And that's what we want. We want to be as clear and explicit as possible so students know the work in front of them, so they understand the work in front of them. 100%. Now, let, let's move on to another strategy, and I like this one as well, and that is eliminating the word failure from our vocabulary. So I, I often, in fact, I, I mean, I see this on Twitter all the time, and I saw it as I was uh, just scrolling through even yesterday, but uh, I often reference the word FAIL as an acronym, uh, First Attempt in Learning. So I'm wondering if maybe you can talk about the empowerment we give students when we recognize inaccurate attempts as a positive in their learning process. Well, think how often you have seen uh, workshops entitled Failure is not an option. Failure is an option. I mean, it really is. But the very first thing we need to do is get rid of the word failure. And here's why. Okay. Going back to what you said, first attempt in learning, I, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. But unfortunately, failure has become, and I think you'll agree, a very negative connotation. Yeah. It's like if we failed at something, no attempt was made. Like and that's the simply be all, not end true. All. Right. Often an attempt was made. It may not be the attempt that the teacher wanted it may, or the, with the result. It may not be the attempt, um, again, the result the student wanted. But unless that student is, is truly sitting at that desk with the head down and producing nothing, which, let's face it, is so rare, Scott, mm -hmm. that some kind of an attempt was made. So we need to get rid of fail. We need to... Let students know, again, as I said earlier, the work is going to be hard. There's going to be setbacks. And will there be times you're not successful? Absolutely. But what did you learn in the process? And, and here's the other thing. You know, we talk about, as I just said, but maybe you weren't successful. What does success mean? Because if I learned something in that process, wasn't that a success? Yeah, absolutely. So if I learned... Right. So if I learn this strategy, so let's go back to the science experiment, and I learned that this particular strategy didn't work, okay, I might not have gotten the outcome I wanted, but wow, I realized this strategy didn't work. I'm not going to use it again. That's, that's a pretty big learning. You know, when you and I were talking, as you said, a, a few weeks ago, one of the examples I gave him, and we kind of laughed about it, was that clog sink. You know, I, I think about... I think about how today, especially, you know, if my sink is clogged, I am not going to a plumber right away. It can be expensive. And what can I do to maybe fix it myself, yeah. you know, without, without making too big of a mess, right? So I'll go to a YouTube video, I'll check it out. Um, maybe I can actually fix it. Or if I can't, at least I know what's wrong with it, that I can go to the hardware store and maybe talk to somebody, again, a resource, maybe get some materials, some tools, again, more resources. But if I am able to fix that thing, holy cow, the empowerment oh I feel. Yes. Well, now let's take that same thing and put it on a student. So I've overcome that obstacle or I've met that setback. Holy cow, that empowerment causes the student, causes the student to say, give me another challenge. I'm feeling good. I want to try it again. Yeah. And, and if it doesn't quite work that way, I go back to what I said earlier. What strategies do I know are working or which ones aren't and good for you for learning that? And that's when we're writing that reflective piece. The student can share all of that with us and say, okay, maybe uh, maybe it didn't work this way, and that's okay, but I know I'm not going to use this strategy next time. That's a learning right there. So, again, get rid of that word fail. It's not necessary. Negative connotation. And just let students know that, again, those setbacks are there, but we're going to keep moving on. 100%. And, and I often, as you talk and, and you talk about the – the the sink the clog sink and uh, you know yeah. I, I can tell you firsthand I mean you call a plumber you're you're out two hundred bucks just making that call uh, but you know yeah. the the science behind of what research tells us 
by students succeeding through hard work versus success. The the students that know that they've put hard work in versus the one that were just congratulated for their success, they're they're going to work even harder next time because they have that, you know, sort of like like you said, the empowerment. And so we're by by giving them that opportunity to to experience failure but then you know ultimately get it the we are oh my goodness we're giving them so much boost internally that why would we not take that away from them absolutely i agree all right so here here's the thing i've been excited to get to this next question and uh because it it's something that we often do without realizing the potential harm and and look my hands up i'm probably guilty but that is downplaying the difficulty of the content being learned uh and and i i have to laugh because i said i'm probably guilty heck i probably do this with my doctoral students saying oh you know a dissertation's not hard and you know you shouldn't have any problem getting this done if you just put a little effort but that's you know that and it could happen it could happen in any class it could be that experiment in science you were talking about it could be solving an equation in math writing the essay in english but what do you see as dangerous to saying this is so easy or saying you shouldn't have any problem getting this done? You know, I think, and we have to take this from a place of love, and here's why. I think when teachers use that language, in all honesty, think of what they're trying to do. They're trying to maybe um, tamp down or eliminate any anxiety, yeah. right? They're trying to let students know that, hey, you can be successful, you can master this, but my concern is when I start saying things like, oh, this is so easy. You shouldn't have any problem. You'll get it right away. There's going to be a couple of kids in that back row who didn't get it right away. Oh, yeah. Who didn't understand the first try. And it's not easy. And right away, you've got those kids who are sinking deeper and deeper into their chairs thinking, wow, am I dumb? Why, why didn't I get it right away? And everybody else yeah. did. The opposite so, of empowerment. Absolutely. So we need to you know, again, flip that switch and we need to let them know this work is going to be tough. It's going to be challenging. However, it's worthy of your time and talent. I chose this work because I trust you in trying. I trust you in the attempt. And I think that trust, while I know that trust, trust helps to create that classroom community that we want. Because when you have students that are engaged in that productive struggle as a classroom, you have students that are more likely and willing to help each other, more likely and willing to share what they've learned with each other. The other thing, too, it goes back to that process piece we talked about. Again, that artifact is important. Let's face it, Scott, it's what we have to grade, right? We can't, we, we yeah. can't eliminate the, the, the final paper or that final science experience. Um, mm -hmm. experiment. I get all that. Mm -hmm. But we have to ask more than, we have to look at more than just that product. It's what are you achieving as you're going through this? What are you learning as you're going through this? You know, if that work is so darn easy, what are they going to learn in the process? Right. Not much. But if that work is tough, and as I mentioned earlier, again, with the thing, and there's some sense of look what I accomplished, look what I was able to do, um, there is there is a real sense of self that goes along with that, and I think well, let's face it, students remember the hard work versus something that's boring. They're going to remember a class where oof, that was a tough class, but wow, did I learn a lot. Um, that's the stuff that you know our students come back and tell us about. Yeah, and and I I never never once uh, want to insinuate to my listeners and cuz i i don't that we we do it to sort of undermine what we're we're teaching and and i do think that it's done out of love and and best intentions i do too uh, I, I i honestly do i mean even even whenever i'm talking about myself with doctoral students um it is but but ultimately and, and let me let me just use the doctoral students and then let me go all the way back down to my first grade students you know i mean quite a quite a large gap and different academics but if i if i take the approach and and i'm up front and i say you know 
this is this is going to be difficult. We might struggle a little bit on this. You know, it's definitely it's it's not it's not easy to get. And then whenever they do get it, wow, the the chest that can be puffed out as they go to family members and say, you know, my my teacher said this wasn't going to be easy, but I got it. And you know, it, we went through this process, but but we got it. And, and I mean, again, it goes back to to empowerment and what we're doing positively by just being upfront and and let's face it honest we're being honest with with the material that we're getting ready to present absolutely and scott i i too want to touch that i as you said when teachers are saying that this work is easy you should have no problem that is a that is coming from a place of love because remember i mean <laughs> we went through a pandemic yeah and when you're talking socially emotional we were doing our best as teachers to love every single student we had on our roster. From afar, we were doing our very best. And I think we, we focused very much on doing whatever we could to eliminate as much academic anxiety as possible. Yeah. And I think, I, I think to a degree there was probably a time and place for that. Now, um, maybe with, with, being back together, being um, a classroom community again. Um, let's take some of those hard steps together. Let's take some of those first steps together and, and um, let's see what we can do. And as you said, being able to puff out one's chest and say, hey, look what I did. That's a pretty great feeling. <laughs> it's a wonderful feeling. Absolutely. Hey, Peg, before we go, when you and I first spoke, we had a great discussion on this last strategy surrounding creating appropriate time and space for students to be successful. Now, the best laid out classroom may not be the most conducive to learning for all students. So what recommendations can you give listeners to better enhance time and space issues as we work from getting students from not yet to you're there? Well, I think there's two of them, and this is, this is something that can be done literally tomorrow. Um, first of all, we, we, we are at the mercy of our classroom configuration or the mercy of a bell system, right? I mean, there's really nothing we can do about that. That's right. usually district mandate. But maybe space in our classroom can be adjusted by, even if it's eliminating the rows, more flexible seating, putting students in pods, um, having a podium for those students that like to stand. Stand. Maybe having single desk for those who prefer to work alone, table for those that want to be more collaborative, even little things like that, cushion, you know, for those who want to sit on the floor. All of that lends itself to um, encouraging space that may not be there. How's that? The second thing, the second thing I wanted to say too is time. You know, some periods are 45 minutes. Reagan, we have a block. Um, they have their positives and their negatives. But within that time, we really can't change much. But instead of a lesson maybe being one class period, could it go two class periods? Is that possible? Um, could time be, be reconfigured by teaching with a peer, co-teaching? Could a teacher plan another lesson with a, another teacher and create a co, uh, an interdisciplinary lesson? Is that possible? You know, when we're able to change our space, so let's say I'm able to take my class to the library today, and I'm able to change um, time, so I'm going to co-teach today with another teacher, I think that can also help change a student's mindset. Absolutely. You know, if, if, I'm, in that, if I'm in that role, and I'm in that role Monday through Friday, every day, fifth period, um, that can be hard, and that can be a yawner. I think if I can move things around. So for your listeners, think about what they can do tomorrow. Can they talk about an interdisciplinary lesson with another teacher for second semester? Can they maybe check out the library? Um, and, you know, I'm going to use the library once a month now for a change in venue. Um, something like that. I think those are very easy things that can, again, give our students um, an opportunity to uh, look Look at learning in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, if if listeners want to learn more 
about the uh, you know not yet classrooms part two of of the book we mentioned earlier not yet and that's okay has eight uh, not yet classroom examples in which you you cover from the practical classroom to the flexible classroom constructive classroom I mean a lot of great suggestions coming out of this book not yet and that's okay how productive struggle fosters student learning. Peg, I appreciate the conversation today and uh, and giving us a little bit more insight on what productive struggle looks like. Thank you, Scott. This has been great. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity and hopefully you and I can continue the conversation at another time. Oh, I look forward to that. Absolutely. You can find Peg on Twitter. Search at Peg Grafwalner. Before I wrap up today's episode, don't forget to head over to my website, eScottEngland.com, and click on the Read More link to read more about PEG. And I also want to remind you, if you haven't already, please subscribe to Anchored in Education on whatever platform you get your podcasts. While productive struggle might be new to my vocabulary, it isn't going anywhere anytime soon. I absolutely Love the idea of the not-yet approach and how productive struggle can foster learning. It takes me back to a time when my daughter, Sage, was probably three or four. She had this little toy piano that was on a little stand. One day, we came in and she had disassembled it. Now, I'm not talking about she had taken it off the stand. I'm talking she found a screwdriver and took the entire thing apart. We could see all the wires and all the other components that truly were never meant to be seen by the consumer. I, of course, was ready to throw it out. She, however, was ready to put it back together. It took time. There was some struggle and a lot of not yets. But then she got it. And this is the most amazing part. It worked. She would go on to routinely disassemble her toys to see how they were constructed, and then she would put them back together. And while she did it out of her own curiosity, we never discouraged her. Oh, she had her times where she became frustrated, but I do not recall a single toy that was ever discarded because she didn't get them put back together. That's the power of the not-yet mindset. That's the power of productive struggle. We need to make sure we are incorporating this not only in our classrooms, but in our personal and professional lives as well. Have you always wanted to get a book published, but haven't because, hmm, it's a struggle? Well, you're just not there yet. Keep going. No matter what the goal is, if it's difficult to obtain, it's probably worth it in the end. Keep on going. Because at the end of the day... The productive struggle is what keeps us anchored in education.